Today's our crop of the day is the Tatse waterfall in northern Laos and it's a beautiful example of tufa dams. The falls are in a karst valley to the southeast of Luang Prabang and the some more at Quang Si to the southwest. Tufa dams are important because they look very similar to the travertine limestone that forms in the hydrothermal pools around hydrothermal vents but they occur from natural springs at surface temperature. And note that despite the similarity of the name, tufas have nothing to do with tufs. Tufs are ash deposits derived from volcanoes. Tufas are chemical deposits of calcite on the bottom of pools with water saturated in calcium carbonate. The water originally comes from rainfall. On its way to the ground, rainwater dissolves CO2 from the atmosphere and on the ground the water picks up additional CO2 from plant roots and decaying organic matter. When that rainwater percolates through the rocks and encounters carbonates, it dissolves calcite until it becomes saturated. Calcite plus water plus CO2 goes to calcium cations and bicarbonate anions. That dissolution process is the main mechanism that produces caves in limestone. The amount of calcite that the water can carry is directly related to the amount of CO2 that was dissolved into the water. The water that feeds these streams comes from groundwater springs. The surrounding mountains are mostly karst topography and most of the outcrops are limestone. As a result, the water is super saturated in calcium carbonate. When the saturated water returns to the surface via a spring, some of that CO2 is lost back into the atmosphere. The dissolution reaction is reversible, so if CO2 is removed from the water, the reaction is pushed to the left and calcite precipitates out of the solution. The deeper water is protected from the atmosphere, but as it flows over the edge of the pool and gets agitated, the surface area exposed to the air increases and it loses some CO2. That mechanism causes the calcite to precipitate preferentially around the lip of the pool. So the wall of the dam grows higher and higher until it gets unstable and it gets destroyed by a big flood or a catastrophic landslide. Carbonate groundwater springs often support abundant vegetation adapted to the mineral rich water. Green water plants remove CO2 from solution during photosynthesis. And there's some evidence that algae and bacteria are involved in the carbonate precipitation processes. They certainly contribute to some of the unusual surface textures that develop in tufa dams. Hydrothermal springs heated by volcanic activity can also deposit banded calcite rocks, but they're referred to as travertine rather than tufa. Similar processes of calcite dissolution and reprecipitation operate in hydrothermal springs but some or all of the CO2 in the water is derived from the magma that's heating the system. The magmatic CO2 can be in much higher concentrations than the atmosphere, so much more CO2 can dissolve in the water. As a result, the hydrothermal water can dissolve and carry much more calcite on its way through the rocks. When the hydrothermal water reaches the surface, it loses CO2 to the atmosphere just like ambient temperature springs. But the process is more dramatic because the water starts with a much higher concentration of CO2. The water is also at a higher temperature and it's often brought to the surface quickly resulting in a sudden drop in pressure. All of those things accelerate the escape of CO2 from the water. Some hydrothermal carbonate springs lose CO2 so rapidly that they actually effervesce like a soft drink rather than boiling in a traditional sense. The result is much faster deposition of calcite and larger amounts of calcite from the same volume of water. The resulting travertine carbonate can closely resemble the tufa around ambient groundwater springs. So how do you tell the difference between tufa and travertine when you're looking at a fossil system where the heat is long gone? The most obvious visible difference in the field is porosity. Tufa tends to have much more abundant cavities and be less dense than travertine carbonate. The cavities often represent molds after plant fragments or algal layers since organic growth is generally more abundant around ambient temperature springs. Because tufa dams form at the surface, they often include leaves and tree roots and other pieces of organic material that become entombed in the carbonate. Palisade texture formed by parallel fibres of calcite growing perpendicular to the banding in the rock 
is a useful but not absolute indicator of travertine carbonate that's grown in hydrothermal spring environments. Aragonite is a polymorph of calcite that's slightly more stable at higher temperatures, so it tends to be more abundant in travertine from hydrothermal systems. Isotopes can also help because the CO2 that's derived from magmatic sources has more of the heavy C13 isotope and some of that ends up in the calcite that's reprecipitated at the surface. The gold standard for identifying hydrothermal pools is to find evidence of chemically deposited silica. Opaline silica, chalcedonic silica, coliform crustiform banding, and in some cases sinter. They tend to occur much closer to the hydrothermal vent and sometimes you'll see them as fragments deposited from phreatomagmatic eruptions. So just because you see a series of stacked carbonate terraces just like these ones, or perhaps a fossilised one like this, you can't automatically assume you're in a hydrothermal pool environment. You might be looking at a series of tufa dams that are around a regular groundwater spring and the water's coming out at room temperature. 